Hello, my name is Alex. I'm the host of the Corporate Cowboys podcast. Welcome to season four of the Corporate Cowboys podcast, powered by Incorporating Associates. We'd like to start the season off by recommending you visit our pages, our social media connections. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Patreon. If you would like to donate and keep this operation nonprofit, we would we would most highly appreciate it. Uh, you can find us at uh, the Corporate Cowboys Podcast on Patreon. There are links available for a Cash App, a Venmo, a PayPal as well. You can visit us online uh, via the links provided in this podcast. We'll start the season off by reading to you a book that was authored, that was written in the 1980s and uh, published in 1983. A very controversial book, but what do you know? I'm a controversial person. Corporate cowboys in and of themselves live for fucking controversy. They live for it. And uh, being an operative who works in the gray, who works with shadows, who works with the uh, questionable, who works with the, with the obscure and the ominous, I think this book will shed some light on, uh, on life, essentially, and will be very educational to individuals, uh, to an individual's mindset going into, let's say, doing dirt and putting in work and juggling life and death. It's a balancing act, ladies and gentlemen. It's a balancing act. The book is called Hitman. And you can find it online. It's a manuscript that was written by an author under the pseudonym Rex Farrell. Farrell, like a feral animal. Rex, that's what? King? Farrell? So King Farrell. The complete title is Hitman Online. A technical manual for independent contractors. It was originally published by Paladin Press. And uh, it served as the basis for a case in the 90s, actually. It's provided to us in the foreword by the author here or by the editor of this uh, particular manuscript. I will provide commentary along the way. I'll provide my independent thoughts. And uh, every so often, our guest AR will also be joining us to provide any additional thoughts. In 1993, a triple murder was committed in Montgomery County by a man who was alleged to have used this book, Hitman, as his guide. He was caught and convicted and sentenced to death. Wanting to profit from the loved one's murder and realizing that the murderer himself was too poor to be worth suing, the family of those killed by the Hitman sued Paladin Press, the publisher of the book Hitman saying Paladin Press, quote-unquote, aided and abetted the murder. <laughs> okay, I mean, I guess if Paladin Press was, was helping this, this particular individual acquire weapons and polish up guns and, and, and necessarily steadying their hand, I don't know, we'll see. May 21, 1999, Paladin Press settles the case, giving the families of those killed by the hitman several million dollars, agreeing to destroy the remaining 700 copies of the book in their possession and surrendering any rights they have to publish and reproduce the work. While the families were successful in profiting from their loved one's death, ooh, shady, they 
have not been successful in stifling the book. Good for us. The book was initially published in 1983. There you go. 13,000 copies of the book are now in existence. There has only ever been one case where the book was associated with a crime. In that case, the criminal had recently finished a lengthy prison sentence and had a history of prior violent crime. It is our opinion, the, the authors, not necessarily myself. Anything I read or anything I say in the course of this narration and commentary does not necessarily reflect my advocacy or disdain for those who work as hitmen or hit persons. Fucking, fucking politically correct. It is our opinion this book has never incited a murder, that the settlement of the Paladin Press case was wrong and forced by the insurance company, and that this book and no book should be banned. We invite the public to judge for themselves. That said, here is Hitman. Nice. I mean, the, the, the foreword is what it is. It provides a little bit of context, a little bit of, of uh, historical positioning on where this book exactly falls in the timeline of society, of when it was written, what happened around its writing, when it was published. And apparently some motherfucker who got their hands on the book, who had just got popped from prison, who had just got who had just got let go from prison and already had a history of violent tendencies, place the blame for their actions on this book. I mean, what a piece of shit. If you can't take responsibility, if you cannot accept accountability for your actions and instead deflect it and instead blame some other source outside of yourself, it makes you a weak piece of shit. It makes you a weak piece of shit. If the locus of control in your life exists outside of yourself, outside of your mind, and yeah, I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll hand it to you. I'll put it, I will slip it into your pocket. I'm not going to pick it out for you. I will slip it into your pocket that at times, an environment will dictate how you act. But, and this is a large ass. <laughs> this is a great ass. But how you act also influences your environment. And if this motherfucker already had a tendency to act out violently before having gotten their hands on this book. This book is just extra. This book is fucking gravy on top. This book is, addition, is excess calories. A case, some cause of action, using this, this manual as a grounds for finding a publisher, not even the writer, they didn't even go after the writer, and the writer did well by using the pseudonym Rex Farrell. But going after a publisher, damn. I mean, that just impacts, it impacts a lot of, uh, a lot of what it means to, to use one's free speech, freedom of the press, freedom to express an idea and have the idea out there to be challenged, to be appreciated. And appreciation isn't always a positive thing. When you appreciate something, you're necessarily evaluating it, whether it's good, whether it's bad. And it can be challenged. It can be changed. It could be made better. That's some corporate cowboy shit. Anyways, there's dedication next. And it says, to those who think, to those who dare, to those who do, to those who succeed. 
Success is nothing more than taking advantage of an opportunity. It, it's quoted, it's a quote by Anonymous, but that might as well say motherfucking corporate cowboys. There's <laughs> a warning, a warning to follow. Warning, it is against the law to manufacture a silencer without an appropriate license from the federal government. There are state and local laws prohibiting the possession of weapons and their accessories in many areas. Severe penalties are prescribed for violation of these laws. Neither the author, nor the publisher, nor Alex, who was narrating this motherfucking book, assumes responsibility for the use or misuse of information contained in this book. It's for informational purposes only. I take no responsibility for what you do. You must take responsibility for what you do. Damn, that was pretty well set up. I had to rip into this little bitch who blamed the book. And the book itself tells us in the warning that the book is not responsible for what we do with it. God damn. Okay. Uh, briefly, we'll just go over the contents. There is a preface, and that is a couple of pages long. There's a prologue, also a couple pages long. I would imagine it uh, sets up some sort of theme. Chapter one, chapter one is titled The Beginning, and it is about mental and physical preparations. Chapter two, titled Equipment, and that is about selection and purpose. Chapter three, titled The Disposable Silencer. Then it's about a poor man's access to a rich man's toy. Chapter four is titled, More Than One Way to Kill a Rabbit. I've heard it uh, said, more than one way to skin a cat, right? I mean, assuming the cat's already dead, but damn, if you ever try to skin a live cat, that's some psycho shit. I'm not saying I've, I've ever bear witness to it, but uh, yeah. And it's about the direct hit is not your only alternative. So I guess you could hit folks indirectly. Hmm, tap, 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 hmm, interesting. Chapter five, titled Homework and Surveillance. It's about mapping a plan and checking it for accuracy. Chapter six, Opportunity Knocks. And that's about finding employment, what to charge and who to avoid. Chapter seven, getting the job done right. When the described hit went down, no, 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 sorry. It's about why the described hit went down the way it did. Again, that's chapter seven, getting the job done right. Chapter eight is entitled Danger, Ego, Women, and Partners. And it's just about controlling your situation. I'm, I'm reading uh, like little brief one-liners about what the chapter contains. Chapter nine appears to be the final chapter, and that's entitled Legally Illegal. And that's about enjoying the fruits. I would imagine the fruits of your labor, which are legally illegal, technically illegal. So not so much in the gray area as it is a deep dive into the gray, into the questionable, whereas no, it's a deep dive into the gray, into the questionable, where if you got to ask, dot, 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 right? <laughs> if you got to ask, that shit's fucking illegal. On to the preface. <clears throat> Apologies. A little water. A woman recently asked how I could, in good conscience, write an instruction book on murder. I'm already re getting ready for a voice. How can you live with yourself if someone uses what you write to go out and take a human life? She whined. I'm afraid she was quite offended by my answer. It is my opinion that the professional hitman fills a need in society and is, at times, the only alternative for quote-unquote personal justice. Moreover, if my advice and the proven methods in this book are followed, certainly no one will know. 
Some people would argue that in taking the life of another after premeditation, you act as God, judging and issuing a death sentence. But it is the employer, the man who pays for the service, whatever his reason might be, who acts as judge. The hitman is merely the executioner, an enforcer who carries out the sentence. There are many, many instances when atrocities are committed that the law cannot or will not pursue. And other times when the law does its part, but the American legal system is so poor that real justice is not served. In those cases, as in cases of personal revenge and retribution, a man must step outside the law and take matters into his own hands. Damn, that, that shit's getting deep, man. It's just the fucking preface. Preface? Pref preface? 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 How do I fucking pronounce that? Let's go with preface. Since most men are capable of carrying out their threats and wishes only in their heads, it becomes necessary for a man of action to step in and do what is required. A special man for whom life holds no real meaning and death holds no fear. A man who faces death as a challenge and feels the victory every time he walks away the winner. The, that feeling of victory. And, and it's not often that folks feel it because nowadays this shit's simulated. It's simulated through video games. It's simulated through apps. It's simulated through likes. And, and, and that's why uh, when folks step away from the fucking keyboard, when folks step away from the fucking internet and really try to press somebody for, uh, for clout and then they get punched in the fucking mouth, I mean, victory doesn't always taste sweet. Victory could be you getting your just dessert. You getting what you rightly deserve, and that might be a fucking slug to the mouth, a slug to the head, and another two slugs to keep you dead. Some men could not kill under any circumstances. Others could kill only in self-defense or to protect what they hold dear. One man learns to kill in times of war and spends the rest of his life trying to forget the horror, while his brother may consider all his wartime efforts a justifiable part of his past, having no effect on his present. And, and just a small note here, uh, this manuscript, because it was picked from uh, online in PDF format, uh, does contain some typographical errors, some typos, if you will, and I've done you all the courtesy of highlighting them and fixing them without significantly materially changing the, uh, the substance of the writing. Why? Because, I mean, I'm like what I'm I like what I'm reading. I like what I'm reading. So as I go along, I've highlighted and I've written in some of these uh, words because if I just read like a fucking robot and I don't take into account what I'm reading, what I'm, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to uh, put some emotion into, uh, it'll just come off as shit. It'll, it just won't make sense. Continuing. How many times have you shared a few beers with a group of macho buddies who eventually turned the subject of conversation from women and sports to that of guns, ammunition, wars, and killing. It seems that almost every man harbors a fantasy of living the life of Mac Bolin. Uh, Mac Bolin, damn, I didn't even Google that fool. I didn't, I did not duck, duck, go that fool. But I would imagine uh, that man would be uh, similar to maybe a... Um, like a Jack Reacher type of character, a Jason Bourne type of character, some kind of jackal, like a Leon the Professional type of guy. It seems that almost every man harbors a fantasy of living the life of Mac Bolin or some other fictional hero who kills for fun and profit. Fun and profit, some psycho shit, but 
They dream of living by their reflexes, of doing whatever is necessary without regard to moral or legal restrictions. But few have the courage or knowledge to make that dream a reality. When the bragging and boasting starts, I just sit back and smile as one of the others talks of what he would do and how he would be if it weren't for family obligations, mortgages, and corporate jobs. Damn, that really strikes a chord with me because while I don't sit in circles and, and brag and boast, or, or maybe I do, like, like this author here who sits back, who's, who sits back and smiles. I mean, I, I don't necessarily smile either because we're not sharing. Uh, we're, we, I mean, we don't always share successes. That's just reality. Sometimes you share war stories and um, it's like a little show and tell of battle scars. They aren't physical. Some of them are necessarily mental. Some of them belong in our portfolios of successes and um, <laughs> learning opportunities. <laughs> Never want to say failures, but I mean, I think the ultimate failure is fucking dying and ending up six feet deep. And if that ever happens, I just won't be around to share it. So be it. But time and time again, how I have heard that excuse, motherfuckers leaning on their families, motherfuckers leaning on their, on their personal consumption habits because they got bills to pay, because they got a fucking corporate job to keep. They're afraid of rocking the boat, afraid of really taking the shit by the reins and being a corporate cowboy. You might be like my friends, interested but unsure, standing on the sidelines, afraid to play the game because you don't know the rules. Within the pages of this book, you will learn one of the most successful methods of operation used by an independent contractor. You will follow the procedures of a man who works alone, without backing of organized crime or on a personal vendetta. Step by step, you will be taken from research to equipment selection to job preparation to successful job completion. You will learn where to find employment, how much to charge, and what you can and cannot do with the money you earn. But deny your urge to skip about. Don't fucking skip through the chapters. Don't skip through the episodes on this podcast, and especially not this season because we're coming fucking hot. Deny your urge to skip about looking for the good parts, quote unquote. Start where any amateur who was serious about turning professional will start at the beginning. Start where any amateur who is serious about turning a consummate professional will start at the beginning. Man, that's pretty hot, man. It's pretty hot, man. A little sip of water. And that's a preface. On to the prologue. <laughs> On to the prologue. He sleeps while the plane is in flight, having learned long ago that few people will try to make conversation with the sleeping man. At 1.35 p.m., the stewardess awakens him. They are about to land. That shit reads like a fucking bedtime story, yo. That even rhymed, low key. He enters the terminal and casually strolls past the embracing couples and reunited families, heading directly for the men's room. He is just another of the hundreds of businessmen who arrive at and depart from a major city airport on any given day. Safe inside the toilet stall, he locks the doors and slips out of the business suit he chose to wear on the trip. From his duffel bag, he pulls faded jeans, sweatshirt, and tennis shoes. Hurriedly, he pulls on the clothing. I don't know why. I don't know why he's got to fucking hurry, man. When, when you're on a fucking hit, and it sounds, this is what it sounds like now, because it, it just, it, a fucking twist already in the first three paragraphs. He's on a fucking hit. He says, hurriedly, he pulls on the clothing. I don't think you got to fucking hurry, man. Take your sweet time. Why? Because we're, we're balancing life and death here. <laughs> 
Then, balancing a small mirror on the back of the toilet, he slips a stocking cap over his hair to flatten and hide it before pulling on a shoulder-length wig. His neatly folded suit, shirt, and tie fit snugly on top. From a zippered side pocket, he takes a pair of tinted wire-rimmed glasses and a nondescript hat. In less than 10 minutes, he leaves the men's room a different man. Uh, I think it's saying that uh, he stuffed his suit, shirt, and tie back inside of the duffel bag. Um, there seems to be a grammatical error there, but I'm not giving a fuck. At the row of car rental booths in the airport lobby, a tall hippie in a sweatshirt stands... No, I'm sorry. At the row... At the row of car rental booths in the airport lobby, a tall hippie in a sweatshirt waits in line to rent a car. You see, in that context, that they're standing there in a fucking sweatshirt tells me that he didn't put a fucking suit and shirt and tie snugly on top. Snugly on top of this fucking disguise. Get the... F Anyways, why am I getting mad at... Why, why am I getting mad at this Rex Farrell dude? He probably typed it under a fucking under a single light bulb with a paper bag as a fucking lampshade chain smoking cigarettes <clears throat> he does not seem to be inconvenienced by the long lines that are so irritating to the other customers when the girl behind the counter finally gets around to him he responds affirmatively affirmatively he responds see i gotta work on my enunciation still my pronunciation i gotta make that shit clearer at the row of car rental booths in the airport lobby a tall hippie in a sweatshirt waits in line to rent a car he does not seem to be inconvenienced by the long lines that are so irritating to the other customers when the girl behind the counter finally gets around to him, he responds affirmatively to her offer for help. Yeah, I want to rent a small car for a few days. She takes in his appearance. She has seen his type many times before and immediately interprets his use of the word small to mean cheap. She suggests an economy car that is terrific on gas and comes with unlimited mileage. He explains that he intends to pay cash for the use of the car. This is already a fucking issue because cash is being phased out little by little, especially when it comes to renting cars. To renting anything at this point. She tells him that he may do so when he brings the car back, but a valid driver's license and major credit card are required identification for security purposes from an ordinary looking wallet notice here that the key key operative term here is ordinary looking wallet not a badass motherfucker wallet not a bad motherfucker wallet he pulls the necessary identification a valid driver's license and a major credit card both in the name of alfred johnson it's a state driver's license Mind you, a valid state driver's license and a major credit card, both in the name of Alfred Johnson. With a key in hand, he leaves the car rental booth and goes to claim his baggage. Then he wanders to the airport newsstand to purchase a city map and some reading materials. So it looks like in the 80s, they're already... I mean, they've been implementing these quote-unquote security measures, security purposes having to provide a form of ID and a form of payment as security for a security deposit, if you will, before you can pay with cash. And you can still pay with cash in today's day and age, but uh, it becomes a lot more technical when they require a valid driver's license and credit card to boot, you know, to go together. And if you're using a valid state driver's license, then that means that you need to inquire about a connect in the fucking state who can pull levers and plug you with a good driver's license. And then from there, you're essentially creating an identity under which you could apply for a major credit card. 
You're, you're either creating an identity or you are quote unquote borrowing somebody else's. And you're necessarily borrowing because you don't even have to rent this car. If you got enough cash on hand, if you got something valuable to trade, uh, you can borrow somebody's car and, 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 and get yourself an alibi, motherfucking two in one on discount. Bargain hunting out here. <coughs> With key in hand, he leaves the car rental booth and goes to claim his baggage. Then he wanders to the airport newsstand to purchase a city map and some reading materials. Seated in the lobby, he checks the map for an address he memorized weeks earlier. Folding the map so he could follow it while driving, he exits to pick up his waiting car. So my guy picks up a map and reading materials. And he's looking for an address in this map. In the map? That he memorized weeks earlier. In the map, though? I don't know, maybe he's got a fucking yellow page or something. I mean, this is the 80s we're talking about, right? So unless the map is is highly specific as to not only the street address, but street numbers, house numbers. House numbers? What, is he looking for some fucking house? An address. They got address numbers on this map, apparently. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just poking holes where I can. Maybe I'm, I'm critiquing or criticizing at this point when I've got no room for it. I've, I haven't written something uh, this detailed in a fucking minute. I mean, I, I have yet to publish something this detailed. Continuing. Afternoon traffic is moderately heavy on the interstate. Exits, side streets, and intersections are unfamiliar. He drives carefully and obeys all traffic rules. I mean, as you should. When you're on a fucking mission, you're incognito. The assassino. He does not want to become involved in any accidents or pick up any traffic tickets. I doubt they had uh, cameras back then, but more so nowadays, you've got to be on your P's and Q's, moderating your activities and regulating your own conduct. Otherwise, you will get popped. Mark my words. Finally, he arrives in the section of town where he will find the memorized address. He drives slowly down the street until he has located the apartment complex, then drives on past so his interest will not be observed. He continues to scout the neighborhood, checking streets and consulting the city map he carries for possible escape routes. He notes that the neighborhood is upper middle class, neatly kept lawns and sidewalks with a population consisting of mostly singles and young families. Three blocks west of the apartment complex, there is a park which has a small pond. One block east, he finds a large shopping center which has a movie theater and an adult bookstore that is open all night. So you could, you know, maybe catch a flick and get some Cop some fucking hustlers or playboys, whatever they fucking had in the 80s. Funny. <clears throat> About a mile away, at the point where he exited the interstate highway, there are several chain motels and fast food restaurants. He heads back in that direction and pulls into a motel parking lot. He jots down the California license tag number of a car parked near the restaurant entrance. It is 4.15 p.m. The motel clerk is disinterested and mechanical in registering him. He fills out the required form in the name of Sam Wilcox, gives a fictitious address in Los Angeles, and uses the California tag number from the car parked at the restaurant. The clerk does not ask for further identification. Two things. This is a shitty fucking clerk. And as you might have noticed, our man's here is using a different identity. So if the clerk were to be doing their job and ask them for some form of ID, what's this guy going to do? Pull out another ID? I mean, pull out another uh, state identification with the name Sam Wilcox on it? 
I highly fucking doubt it, but it could be some, um, what's it called? Some, <laughs> some writing liberties on behalf of our beloved author, Rex Farrell. Anyways, to this disinterested clerk, our man's, Albert, or Sam, says, I'm a late sleeper. I'd like a room on the back side, away from the pool if you have it, he requests. Will that be in cash or charge, says the clerk without looking up, or the clerk asks without looking up. You see, I'm trying to stay true to the fucking words here. I don't want to change it up for you. He lays down enough small bills on the counter to cover two days lodging. Cash, he answers. (laughs) Cash. Cash, he answers. He drives the car around back, locates his room, and takes in his luggage. By 4.15, he is seated on the bed, studying the contents of a large manila envelope taken from his locked suitcase. Using the information from the envelope and the telephone directory, he begins to chart routes on the city map. Afterwards, he carefully studies an assortment of photographs taken from the envelope. Satisfied, he returns everything to the envelope and locks it away in the suitcase again. So our man's has a locked suitcase. Probably not uh, luggage, probably not in the form of a um, zipper. I don't think he's got a zipper. I think this bitch has got hinges and locks because uh, most zippers can easily be defeated. Wearing a jogging outfit and still in his hippie disguise, he drives to the shopping center and locks his car. On foot, he begins a slow jog through the neighborhood. He circles the block and carefully scrutinizes the area before cutting into the apartment complex parking lot. So he cuts, he jogs around the block and cuts through the apartment complex parking lot. The sun is just beginning to set. Now this scene, the scene that the author sets up here is very nice. Why? Because the sun might be setting and depending on the time of day or the time of the sunset, uh, a lot of, uh, there aren't so many shadows as there are just a lot of gray colors. So a lot of things in that twilight hour uh, are very much forgettable, are very much forgettable. Sunsets might be memorable to some, but people in the fucking sunset are pretty much forgettable to most, in my experience. The apartments are all identical. Well, experiences may vary. Your experience may vary. Your mileage may vary. But uh, again, this is my, my experience, my comments on that. The apartments are all identical, These are apartments, they're not houses, mind you. The apartments are all identical. Patios on the rear are enclosed with privacy walls. On the front, each apartment is separated from the other by an ornamental cedar fence. Two parking spaces are reserved at the front of each apartment for the resident's use. Guest parking is clearly marked in the center of the parking lot, surrounding a small island landscaped with a few scrawny trees and thick bushes. He jogs over to the guest parking lot island and sits down on the curb. So our man positions himself in the center of the action. The sense, pretty much the center of the property wants to get a good vantage point, I would imagine. So removing his shoes and socks, he begins to rub his tired feet. It is 647. Let's see here. It's 415. 4.15 by 5.45, he's seated on the bed. So from 5.45, he's uh, driven to the apartment complex and began running. I mean, that's a solid run, right? That's a solid run. From from uh, 4.45, when he left, when he, locked, every, when he locked, it, locked everything up in his suitcase, to about 6.47, he's had time to drive over to the... Uh, to the movie theater parking lot, drop his car off, and jog a little bit. Was it the movie theater? 
And that's just the shopping center. The shopping center with the moving theater. Just jogged around a little bit. It's 6.47 now. Let's chalk it up to about an hour of reconnaissance, an, an hour of uh, recon, if you will. And if his information is correct at 6.47, the mark should be arriving home from work any time now. If his information is correct, the mark should be arriving home any... The, if his information is correct, the mark should be arriving home from work any time now. At 6.53, so six minutes, a green Mustang pulls into the parking space in front of the apartment. He was under surveillance. He has... <clears throat> Take two. At 6.53... A green Mustang pulls into the parking space in front of the apartment he has under surveillance. The car matches the description of the vehicle belonging to the mark. A heavy set man emerges slowly from the small car. He is puffing on a large cigar. Judging by his physical characteristics and the cigar, this man appears to be the mark. He glances up uninterested as a jogger trots out of the parking lot. So. The mark has seen our man, but the man was already out, was, he was already on his way out of the parking lot. Damn, that's fucking clean. That's fucking clean. And because it's the sunset, you never know. Maybe the sun was in the mark's eyes. No way you could make out who the jogger is, what the jogger even was, male or female, given that the dude has a shoulder length wig on and is dressed like a fucking hippie. Depending on, on their frame, I don't know, you could, he could probably even get away with uh, deceiving the mark completely. He jogs back to the motel, stopping at the fast food restaurant for dinner. The clerk shortchanges him by $5, and the hamburger he orders is not prepared to his liking. But he does not complain. Without drawing any attention, he heads back to his motel where he reads and watches television until 11. So he just, he's just not drawing any attention to himself. Somebody could literally shortchange the man, fuck up his order, fuck up his food order, and he's, he's just not making any complaints. He wants to be as unmemorable as possible. Doesn't, doesn't want to uh, create any events that folks will let her later be able to ID him and then point their fingers at him. It is after 11.30 when he swings his car into the apartment complex parking lot. The Mark's lights are on and his car is still parked in its allotted spot. The Mark is said to spend most of his free time alone at home, staying up late, watching television, and sleeping in until an hour or so before his scheduled time to report for work at a used car lot. Probably where he got the Mustang from. It appears that this information is correct. So my guy, my dude's just checking boxes. He's just checking boxes, checking the trap here before he comes through and collects. <laughs> Early the next morning, he is waiting in his parked car with a pair of binoculars and a newspaper when the Mark leaves the apartment. In the bright morning sunlight, he clearly makes positive identification. This is his man. It's got an exclamation point there, but I'm not trying to yell. <laughs> Using his pre-marked map, he spends the early part of the day checking out the places the mark is known to frequent. Around noon, he drives to the main post office to pick up a parcel he mailed to himself the day before. Mm, okay, as he drives, he contemplates the various places he has checked out. Because of the layout of the apartment complex in relation to the private patios and sectioned courtyards, he decides that the best place to make the hit is in the Mark's own home. Man, this, this motherfucker is ruthless. This motherfucker is cutthroat. He's already, he's already made his mind up. He's going to hit this fool where he lays his head. Back at the motel, he opens the heavily taped parcel, which was addressed to Mark Donaldson. 
there had been no problem in picking up the package stamped fragile precision machined parts today the postal clerk had not even asked for identification damn no, no i mean this is this is these are all ideal circumstances nobody's fucking doing their job nobody gives this fool a, a double take a, a second glance nobody's asking for id this motherfucker is piecemealing shit not hold on not piecemealing shit to himself it's only one package this motherfucker is sending packages stamped fragile precision machined parts and you don't need identification for that i mean i guess it depends if you've also tacked on insurance or signature confirmation or, or of some kind you know but if it's just if it's just I, I suppose if you're just asking the post if you're asking the post office to hold it for someone to pick up Damn, I guess you could just leave whatever fucking name you want, right? I mean, it's 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 federal employees doing federal work. <laughs> we'll chalk it up to that. It's bureaucracy doing bureaucratic work. Inside the first box is a second box. Oh shit, it's a nesting box? And inside the second box is a special set of clothing. Several pairs of rubber gloves a clean pair of tennis shoes, a new disguise, ammunition, a disassembled weapon, and a disposable silencer. Now we're fucking cooking with oil. Now we're cooking with gas. Now we're using sustainably raised, grass-fed lard, my guy. Lightly salted, lightly sweetened. Mm, a little sweet, a little salty. You know I'm still going to put my own touch on that lovingly ooh lovingly he begins to assemble his weapon with clothes with hold up with <laughs> damn don't get me hot don't get me hot and bothered it wasn't clothed sorry it was gloved with gloved hands i mean he i mean he's likely clothed but with gloved hands with gloved hands he wipes every part Inside and out for fingerprints. As he loads the clip, magazine, my guy. You see, this is what makes me think this motherfucker is, is uh... okay. Yeah, he's an independent contractor. The author, the author is an independent contractor. Maybe, maybe they've got their own jargon, their own vernacular that they uh, are accustomed to using. As he loads the clip, he wipes down each of the bullets. He is a man with a job to do. He has the tools, he has done his homework, he knows he has the right target, and he has determined how he will accomplish the job. After putting the tools away, he leaves the motel to fill the gas tank on the car. While he is out, he steals an out-of-state tag from a parked automobile and replaces the rental tag on his car with a stolen tag. Life hack, or pro tip, pro tip, if you're gonna be fucking stealing tags out there, make sure it's the same make and model, all right? Don't get fucking caught lacking. If you have a fucking uh, a coupe and you're stealing shit off of a SUV, if you have a fucking, I mean, come on, just, just, just think it through. Think it at least two more steps through, all right? <laughs> Fuck. You get pulled over and then what? You can't talk your way out of it because the tag doesn't read. That's the whole reason you get pulled over. If the tag reads for an SUV and you're sitting in a coupe like a fucking dunce with your dick in your hand. Back in his room, he dials the airport and gets flight information. Space is available on a flight departing at 11.55 p.m. Damn, so this nigga, this, this dude's doing same day shipping, my guy. Same day delivery. At 7 p.m., the alarm sounds, waking him from a four-hour nap. So my guy's taking cat naps out here. That's a very efficient use of time. This guy sounds, sounds methodical, sounds somewhat mercurial, uh, given his handling of the parcel, given his handling, his management of time, and his organization skills. I mean, thus far, I gotta hand it to him. Props, fucking kudos. He dresses in the clothing that came in his parcel. He puts on the clean tennis shoes and a new disguise. He puts the hippie disguise clothing and shoves and, and shoves into what? He puts and shows into the duffel bag. He hold on, because this is this is worded bad. 
This is wrongly worded. He puts the hippie disguise clothing and shows into the duffel bag. I'm just going to read it as is. Fuck it. He puts the hippie disguise clothing and shows into the duffel bag along with the tools he will be using. So it's all in the duffel. When he is all dressed and packed to go, he has a few very important details to complete. First, he removes the manila envelope from the suitcase and goes over to the bathroom to burn all of the items it contains over the toilet. Remember, this is the 80s, so, I mean, smoke detectors probably weren't all up to par. There might have not even been one in the bathroom, given that this is sounds like a shitty little motel he's staying in for only, or he's only paying for a couple of nights and paying in cash at that. Uh, but nowadays, you can still tie up a smoke detector or tie off a smoke detector and uh, not have it go off on you. Tie off a smoke detector and not having, not have it activate while you are getting rid of, um, getting rid of these important informations. <laughs> one by one, he burns the information sheets, photographs, maps, and all other physical evidence that might prove conspiracy to commit a crime and flushes away the incriminating remains. He pulls out a fresh pair of rubber gloves and begins to wipe down the room for fingerprints. He knows the room will probably be rented again by tomorrow, but he takes the precaution anyway. Smart. He puts all the trash, newspapers, and magazines accumulated during his stay into a plastic garbage bag along with the room's telephone directory and places it beside his luggage. He will dispose of these items on the way to the job site. <laughs> this motherfucker is really acting like a contractor on his way to the job site. Still wearing the rubber gloves, he loads his luggage and equipment into the car, locking it in the trunk, and heads for the Marks neighborhood. He will not be returning to the motel again. Yeah, sounds like a clean sweep. Figured that... When he started wiping down fingerprints, I doubt he was going to be sleeping there again. And, uh, and also, yeah, they kind of foreshadow that when he checked for flight information. He's probably going to be leaving the same night. It's one and done. Wham, bam. Thank you, my fucker. Getting paid and bouncing. At the shopping center, one block from where the Mark lives, he parks the car in the crowded theater parking lot and gets out to continue on foot. So our man's is on foot. Might be armed and considered dangerous. No one is out and about as he walks into the apartment complex parking lot. Protected by the cedar privacy fence, he peeks through a crack in the drapes and sees the mark puffing on a cigar while he watches TV from a recliner chair. The volume is so loud, he can hear the program plainly from his position outside. He goes to the front door where he quietly and efficiently picks the lock. Quietly and efficiently picks the lock? The mark is startled by the intrusion of his entry but is unable to respond quickly enough. He is helpless against the professional. The muffled sound of three shots fired in rapid succession goes undetected by the neighborhood. And the TV was probably loud as fuck, right? So the professional has neatly carried out his assignment. Quickly, but carefully, he checks the body to make sure there is no pulse and drags the body to a place in the apartment where... where, where <laughs> I'm, picturing, I'm picturing a guy dragging this fat mark. And the cigar is probably, I mean, the cigar is either in, still in his mouth, in his hand, or somewhere on the carpet, somewhere on the floor. Apologies. Quickly but carefully, he checks the body to make sure there is no pulse and drags the body to a place in the apartment where it will not be easily detected. At the scene of the shooting, he drops a newspaper over the blood that has seeped into the carpet. So there is carpet. He pockets the three empty cartridges that were ejected from the gun. I would probably use a revolver, but revolvers are hard to suppress. Then, I mean, well, to avoid having to pick up casings after. Then, after a quick check of the apartment to make sure he leaves behind no incriminating evidence, he exits, locking the front door behind him. How courteous. How fucking polite. Resisting the urge to run, he strolls nonchalantly. I like that. I like the use of that. He strolls nonchalantly back to the theater parking lot and his waiting car. 
safe inside, he immediately runs a rat tail file down the barrel of the gun to change the ballistic markings. A little paranoid, but okay. I will let it slide because this man is a apparently a professional. Then he changes back into his hippie clothing and disguise, unobserved while the other car owners are inside viewing the movie. Um, I think he's a little over-trusting because most areas, most, um, what is it, most plazas, most shopping centers have rolling patrol, roaming patrol. You want to be on the lookout for fucking patrolling security. He checks the work clothes carefully for bloodstains. Finding none, he drops them into the charity collection box at the shopping center entrance, keeping the shoes he wore for disposal later. That's good because, yeah, most shopping centers still have those collection boxes. It's nice to see that folks in the 80s weren't uh, all driven by the Wolf of Wall Street mentality. And, uh, well, I mean, they're donation centers, so maybe they are upcycling and going to sell them later at the fucking Goodwill. Who knows? He drives <laughs> at the secondhand store. My bad. Uh, I'm not disparaging the Goodwill. The Goodwill is a great place to get work clothes. Mm. He drives carefully. No, he drives cautiously. He drives cautiously and carefully to another shopping center several blocks away. He feels no panic. My, my, my dude is ice cold. He's calculating. He's cool. <laughs> it will be days before the crime is detected. It will be days before the crime is detected. Days before anyone investigates the Mark's failure to report for work or answer his door. In the crowded parking lot, he disassembles the weapon and removes the stolen tag. Now, his only remaining task is to dispose of the weapon. He gets back onto the interstate highway and heads out of town. Traffic becomes sparse as the city is left behind. So he's moving out to a more rural area. And now, now he begins to toss out the small gun parts at irregular intervals, aiming for water-filled and overgrown drainage ditches. He also tosses out the tennis shoes. At a rest area, he walks through the woods and buries the barrel of the gun. Buries the barrel of the gun. He crushes the plastic silencer and disposes of the bits and pieces as he drives back to town. Just before he reaches the airport, he pulls over to the side of the road and wipes the car for fingerprints. He removes and discards the stolen tag, replacing it with the rental tag. Okay, so that makes sense because having slapped the stolen tag on it, if there are cameras, if there are cameras documenting those vehicles entering and leaving the city, it will have the stolen tags as opposed to the rental tags. This man is just severing connections. He's just severing connections as he goes along, making it harder for his movement uh, to be tracked. And it's respectable. It's respectable. He disposes of the rubber work gloves and replaces them with a pair of leather driving gloves. Ooh, those are... Uh, not as fashionable nowadays. Every now and then I'll throw some on if I need to. But uh, yeah, leather driving gloves. Those should make a comeback. You know what? Fuck it. I wear them enough. Uh, they ought to be worn. They come recommended. They come recommended, especially the, the leather driving gloves. One that are some that are form fitting, some that are form fitting, and that uh, you don't have to change out like you do with these fucking rubber work gloves. Unless you're actually, you know, putting in work. Then he returns the clean rental car to the agency and heads directly to the airport men's room. The bathroom. A short time later, a businessman emerges from the men's room and approaches the ticket counter for information. His flight leaves in only 45 minutes. His flight leaves in 45 minutes. My bad, you know, keeping it original. He checks his baggage, a suitcase and small duffel bag, and goes to the coffee shop to wait for the flight to be called. On the plane, he dozes, having learned long ago that few people will try to make conversation with a sleeping man. To all appearances, he is just another businessman suffering from an exhausting schedule. No one interrupts his rest. And that concludes the prologue.
We'll see you next time.